Okay, we're going to kind of stay on a bit of a theme. Um, so you've noticed back behind me, I, I still says memory as verb. Uh, I'm going to keep that up there for this lecture and for the next lecture because really um, this is such an important point uh, and it's relevant to so many different contexts in which memory um, itself is relevant that I want to make this point very concretely so that you leave the next two lectures both learning some cool stuff uh, and with a really good solid understanding that memory really is a, a very dynamic um, and ever-changing process in a sense. All right. So let's let's begin by looking at legal contexts uh, and some of the ways in which memory has been thought of as reconstructive in that context. Here we go. All right. So week five, lecture three, memory is reconstruction, the law. Yeah. I'm, let me get to the law, um, but let me start here, which is already pseudo legal, I guess. Um, th this is not this does not necessarily depict exactly to this, but the point will be made, I think. Imagine you are a police officer and you get called to a scene and you see this beautiful Corvette that's sitting just like this with these sort of marks. Um, and now you're, so this is the data. You know, this is what you really have. This is what's sitting there in front of your eyes. But your task as a uh, traffic policeman is now to understand what led up to this. Uh, and so you literally have to reconstruct the accident, as it's called. And what we have here, again, is probably a very different accident, um, but is a notion of somebody now going through and thinking of a situation um, and trying to, to imagine the events that led up to this situation. So in order to do that, they're putting together the information they actually have, okay, the actual stuff that was left by the event. But they're putting that together with assumptions about other things that also occurred, assumptions that they're arriving at based on what they see. So how did these stripes get left on the pavement? And what do they tell us about the events that led up? So we make some assumptions and we reconstruct the accident. Now, in the police world, the advantage is you can easily separate the actual data you had from the assumptions that you made. You can keep those very clearly and people can therefore question your assumptions, for example. Well, um, from somebody named Sir Francis Bartlett, Bartlett, who started studying memory, he claimed that memory itself works like this, that it is also a reconstructive process so that we experience some event and there is residue of that event left in memory and later when we retrieve it we do retrieve these little bits but we did not videotape the event we don't have all of the information we only recorded some of the information and we only retrieve some of that information but how do we get this movie in our mind then this episodic memory where does that come from what Bartlett says just like this reconstruction we take the information we have and we take all these assumptions we have about how the world works or you know if we're let's say remembering a trip to Jamaica we have knowledge about Jamaica uh, and so we take the knowledge we have we ha we take assumptions we have about how things work and we take the actual data that we retrieved we put all those together and we get a nice replay in memory the problem is in human memory we have a lot of trouble distinguishing the actual details that were stored versus the assumptions we've made. It feels to us like it's a videotape of the past experience, but a lot of that recreation is not actual data retrieved from the experience, it's assumptions overlaid on it. So that makes memory very dangerous. Um, we can feel like we remember something that isn't true. That's really the point I'm going to make now in a couple of um, kind of classic studies from psychology. Uh, the first one comes from a researcher named Elizabeth Loftus, who you see in, down in the corner here. And her experiment um, worked like this. Subjects witnessed on a slideshow an accident between two cars. Okay, so they saw two cars connect, run into each other. Um, now what word, as you see, is going to be very important here because in fact there were no words originally when they saw the event. They just watched slides of these two cars um, coming into contact with each other. But then 
you know, some time passed, they were brought back into the lab, and they were asked about that accident. But they were asked in different ways. The verb that was used was changed. So specifically, one of the questions they were asked, and kind of think about this like a courtroom situation now, because Loftus really um, extends a lot of her data to courtroom situations. So imagine being asked, you're in the witness booth, um, how fast was the red car going when it, now we could say, contacted the blue car? But other subjects were asked, how, how fast was the red car going when it hit the blue car? Third group, how fast was the red car going when it bumped into the blue car, or when it collided with the blue car, or when it smashed into the blue car? The claim here is that the verbs are getting more and more dramatic. And one of the things you see, as shown in this graph, is that the speed estimate that people provide also goes up. So the more dramatically they're asked, and this is the question, how fast was the red car going when it smashed into the blue car? If you say smashed, they think it was going pretty fast. If you say when it hit, they don't think it was going so fast. So the way you ask a question determines the answer that people give. And lawyers know this. They spend a lot of time deciding how to ask questions. Well, okay, so what's going on here? Is it the case that subjects are actually remembering the accident as being more dramatic when you give them a more dramatic verb? Or are they just kind of being congruent with their response? So when you said a dramatic verb, they chose a more dramatic number. They don't really remember it any differently. Maybe their memory is the same. They're just reporting it differently. A lot, Loftus wanted to know which of those were true. Are they reporting it differently, or are they remembering it differently? So she asked a second question. In the actual event that, that the uh, subject saw, there was, in fact, no broken glass. Okay, These two cars contacted, but it was just the contact, a little bit of damage, but no broken glass. But she asked people, did you see any broken glass? So remember, they'd seen the event. Time had passed, and now they're being interrogated about it. Did you see any broken glass? Okay. They had a control condition where they hadn't been asked first about how fast the cars were going when they hit or smashed, etc. Uh, in the control condition, six people said they saw broken glass. So this just shows you that memory, oops, sorry, that memory isn't perfect to begin with. So even though these six people are saying they saw something that didn't occur, we're going to come back to that. Um, in a moment. But most people said no, there was no broken glass. And in fact, when we use the word hit in the earlier one, so if we had first asked them how fast was the red car going when it hit the blue car, people are still, and then, and then we say was there any broken glass, people are still pretty much saying no, there was no broken glass. But when you say smashed, how fast was the red car going when it smashed into the blue car, now suddenly a lot more people are saying Yes, there was broken glass. So the claim here is that by using that word, you are not just changing the way they respond. You're actually changing their memory. When you use a more dramatic word, then the, when they replay the event, they replay it as being more dramatic. The word you use is becoming part of their memory recreation and it's recreating a more dramatic accident, increasing the likelihood of people saying there was smashed glass when there wasn't. Okay. So, you know, all of this suggests that, when, wow, the question you ask when somebody retrieves it changes their memory. And that really, in the legal context, so much of what we do so many of the decisions that we make are based on people's memory. Eyewitness memory is a big part of our prosecuting somebody and putting them in jail. So what this suggests is that, wow, when we're interrogating someone's memory, the questions that we ask and the ways we ask them are actually going to affect the testimony. And the legal system is, is aware of this and very, um, you know, as sensitive as they can be, but very often you will have memory experts as expert witnesses, uh, you know, 
challenging how real an eyewitness memory is and looking at the way they've been interrogated about it. Um, this is just one other example of how dramatic it can be. We had, um, in one study, subjects saw this car go through a yield sign, and then they were later told there was an accident with this car. But when they were interrogated, they said, did the car actually stop at the stop sign? So some people were shown a stop sign uh, at, the, at, at the original one, and so they would answer the question and say, you know, yes or no. But in other subjects, it was a yield sign, so the car didn't have to stop, and it rolled around. But when people were interrogated and said, did this car stop at the stop sign? Even though it was really a yield sign, it's like the witnesses accepted that it was a stop sign and would just say something like yes or no, or, or maybe no, it did not. It, it went right through the stop sign. So by implying there was a stop sign, when people recreated the event, they seemed to have replaced the yield sign with a stop sign in their mind. Very powerful stuff. A lot of this really, you know, uh, starting a whole area actually of research on memory and the law that's really fascinating. Um, you want to learn a little bit more, here you can actually see the original Loftus and Palmer study. Um, you can have uh, hear Elizabeth Loftus talk more generally about memory in the context of eyewitness testimony. And this is, in fact, sort of a podcast, a YouTube podcast of somebody talking, going back a little bit to Sir Fred, Frederick Bartlett, um, who started a lot of this research um, and really pushed that idea of memory as reconstruction. He used something, uh, a poem called War of the Ghosts. Uh, and so it's a kind of an interesting thing. Check that out. You can hear a lot about what he did and the evidence he found for reconstructive uh, memory. Um, also, here are just a couple of, of other web-based resources that go into this a little bit more. Um, the issue of memory and how um, susceptible it is to interference from other information. So when you see an event and you have a memory, other things can change that memory and affect it. Um, so this, actually both of these resources will talk about that issue. So check those out. But before you go, I want to set you up for the next lecture. I want you to look at these words, and I want you to remember these words. Because in the next lecture, um, we're going to do a demonstration on you that shows you just how prone to interference your memory is. So take a few minutes, look at these words, don't write them down, obviously, just look at them. Um, heck, you can even pause it if you want. Um, try your best to remember them, but once you turn this lecture off, don't look at those words anymore. And whenever you're ready to watch the next lecture, and if you can, leave a little bit of time. Don't watch it right now, um, unless you have to, given your life and such. Uh, but if you can wait a little bit, wait a little bit, then come back, and we'll carry on from here next lecture.